listening to. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> We're live. Okay, let me just. There we go. All right, welcome everybody to today's live stream. So, what? We're going to be doing today is um, our prompt is uh, if an aquatic creature adapted to live on land. Probably not the most punchy word like wording of that. I couldn't think of a better way to phrase it, but you get the idea. We're going to be painting uh, some sort of sea life. What it would look like if instead of living in the ocean, I lived on land. What would be different about it? So, um, <clears throat> as always, just for those of you who who don't know, um, you can uh, join along with us, draw along with us. You can do paper or pencil, or you can work digitally, it's up to you. And then you can post it afterwards in the Facebook group, the Daily Sketch Grind, um, and share your work. And our goal is to improve over time as we draw every day and work on our skills. The Facebook group is mainly focused on drawing, so don't post any paintings in there. And uh, you can also share your work with hashtag SketchGrind um, for a chance to be featured on the SketchGrind Instagram page. And you don't have to do the prompt if you don't want to. It's up to you. But every other day we have a prompt. And on the uh, alternating days, we do reference studies. So today's prompt, like I said, is drawing something, uh, an aquatic creature that has adapted to live on land. So as usual, we're going to start with a uh, warm up. We've decided to shorten our warm up time to five minutes instead of 10. It's more drawing time. So the timer has started. <clears throat> While we're warming up, anyone have any good ideas for sea creatures to draw? Like if they looked, what they would look like if they lived on land. I, I decided that I want to kind of stay away from more obvious or cliche ones, like um, maybe not cliche, but just, I mean, I've done other ideas or takes on this before with like sharks and whales and things like that. And I think I want to stay away from that. But what I do, here's what, this is my idea I've got floating around. One of them was like a sea star thing that's like, I don't know. It's weird. I, it might actually just turn out super dumb, but like, you know, like if you take your hand, you have five fingers on your hand and you do that thing where you put them on the ground and you make like a little animal in the middle fingers, like the head, you know, like a long neck or something, something like that, but with a sea star, I don't know. it might just look dumb in my head. I was like, I can maybe like that look cool. Um, that was one idea. I don't think that's the one I'm going to go with, but it was an idea. The other one is uh, that I thought of was to do a uh, a seahorse that is like an actual horse, but with like the aesthetic and the skin and look of a seahorse. Um, so, yeah. And then, oh, also, Caleb, could you share the link to the Facebook group as well? Oh, someone already, dang it. Someone's already doing a seahorse with legs. Well, I might do that anyways. Ooh, squid and octopus is kind of cool. Um, that's not a bad idea. Um, but I do, I don't know, I think I might need to look up some pretty solid reference to do that prompt justice. But and I want to try and practice drawing out of my head on these days and using reference on the other days and get into that habit of drawing upon my mental library. There's nothing wrong with using reference. If I was doing like a professional illustration, I would totally be using reference. But for the purpose of this exercise, which is to practice developing that skill, I don't, I'm not going to. But there's nothing wrong with doing that. Ooh, a desert jellyfish. Somebody suggested that. Victor Von Bonbon. Bon. That's an interesting one. So Renzo is saying, I did what you said yesterday about drawing the simple forms onto the picture, then drawing it without, and it really helped. Oh, awesome. 
That's fantastic. Way to go. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I would keep uh, do it for a couple more days and try more and more complex forms like uh, the more organic a shape you can get and still break it down to forms, the better you'll kind of get at this. So like doing things like uh, it, like insects are kind of can be kind of difficult, like close up images of insects, like like a tarantula or like a praying mantis, stuff like that. Um, yeah, fantastic, dude. That's awesome. Glad to hear that. Ryushinko is saying maybe an eel, but it's like a long lizard. That's not bad. I want it to be pretty clear, like the difference between like it like what's what would be completely different about its biology if it lived on land like things like octopus and squid for example they don't they don't have a skeleton because they live underwater and they don't need that rigid structure to be able to move around as easily but on land they would it seems like it would like pretty much completely get rid of all the defining characteristics that make an octopus <laughs> like an octopus like you know the big soft bulbous sack on the back of its head and the tentacles like all that stuff is becomes a lot less practical on land all right that's time right there okay i'll just make a new layer so even though someone else is doing the seahorse idea, I think I might do it too. Um, yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna do. All right, so let's uh, let's jump in and get started. Um, will you, um, Caleb? Will you give me like a? Just let me know when we're at. 30 minutes, like at yeah. 10 30. So I can like pace myself. Yeah. For sure. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's do this. So I'm gonna start with real. I really want to look like a horse, but be a seahorse. Um, I just <laughs> I'm speaking to the other me's out there who I know I would be thinking this. I wouldn't say anything because I know it's just it's fantasy and sci-fi or whatever. But I know I would be thinking this if someone said that they were gonna adapt what a seahorse would look like if adapted to land, and I would instantly in my mind think. Um, you know that seahorses actually aren't related to horses biologically in any way, shape, or form. Their resemblances are only superficial, that their head slightly resembles a horse. And I'm very aware of that. I know. Um, I'm just <laughs> I'm just doing it because I think it will look cool, even though it has no grounding in actual biological science. So you guys might not care at all, but there might be some people out there who would make that argument. I just want to remind everybody to post any questions that you have for Austin. Feel free to ask him whatever you whatever you want. Obviously regarding art, <laughs> preferably, right? Yeah, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> We can we don't have to talk about art all the time. I don't mind. You can talk about whatever you want. Maybe not whatever you want. There might be some things that I will decline talking about, but um yeah, I'm pretty open. We can discuss different things.
you want to mention briefly why the wireframe is so helpful to you? Um, yeah, it just helps me focus on the main, um, the main body structures. So, um, you got the rib cage, the lumbar part of the spine, the tail, the coccyx and the hips and stuff. Those are kind of like the main body masses that the skeleton attaches to. And so focusing on those helps me start out with a more accurate and more, it's just easier to start drawing the proportions and stuff when you start from here, because it's really, it's really rough. It's really easy to modify things and move them around and things like that. Then if you have a really detailed thing, cause like right now, like I just did, it doesn't really matter if the lines are all messed up and stuff when I resize it because it's, uh, it's just really rough. It's just like a rough sketch. So that's why. Looks like someone in the uh, in the chat asked what the scaly daily sketch grind is. The scaly Dutch grind. <laughs> um, it is um, the daily sketch grind is the name we I came up with for what we are doing here every day, which is getting together and drawing in order to improve our skills. So every other day we're doing reference, and on the alternating days we're drawing from a prompt trying to come up with ideas out of our heads that fit the prompt in today's prompt is if uh, we were drawing something aquatic that had adapted to live on land. I think maybe those feet need to be alternating. Otherwise, he would just fall over. <laughs> Oh, 
So when we do the sketch over this, we can adjust that. All right. We turn that way down here and do our next layer. Too spiky there. No questions today. Everyone is super focused. Oops. Might have to rework the head and neck later. I'm not sure if I'm really feeling that, but we'll leave it for now. I think that helps right there just a little bit. <laughs> Peter Trigg says, chilling in the zone. We've got a question from Heronia Baker. What do you think is the biggest mistake young artists make in their portfolio when they are looking for a job? Good. Uh... Good question. I would say I can think of two big ones. Um, one of them being that they put work in their portfolio that is not um, consistent with the art style of the, the places that they're showing their, their work around to. So like, for example, let's say you want to work for Blizzard, who does like World of Warcraft and Diablo and games like that. And you're taking your portfolio around and kind of trying to get people to look at it, consider you for a job, and all of the work in your portfolio is anime. They're not going to look at your work and want to hire you because they don't make anime and your work doesn't look anything like what they're producing. If you want to work somewhere like Blizzard, you should be making art that looks like it could be art that Blizzard produced. Um, that's the type of stuff you should put in your portfolio. If you want to work for Wizards of the Coast and do magic cards, you should be making art that looks like it could be a magic card, not in an art style that seems completely inconsistent with what they are already producing. That's a big one, especially I would I say a lot of high schoolers say they want to be an animator or be a character designer and work for like Disney or Pixar or DreamWorks and stuff like that. But then their portfolio has a lot of like, anime and or anime style furries and like stuff like that i'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those things what i'm saying is that that's not going to want to make people hire you for things other than 
furries and anime if you want to be an artist for anime comics then try anime that's what you should be doing but if that's not what you're if you're trying to get jobs in other areas and your art is not consistent with what the studios are producing you're going to have a really hard time um, getting anywhere with your portfolio the other thing is putting in way way too much stuff into your portfolio especially things that are like just like all over the place like um putting um like every piece of art you've ever done in your portfolio or anything that could like remotely can be considered good or even sometimes i see people with things that aren't good at all but they just put it in there because it showcases like oh well um i've used illustrator before here's a piece i did in illustrator even if it's not that great i want to put it in there in case they want me to use illustrator then i can show them that i have and that's a really bad idea because typically your portfolio is going to be judged based off of the worst piece in it that's going to be the standard everything gets held to unfortunately but it's i mean like for example if you go see a movie what typically happens is when you see that movie the quality of that movie tends to get based off of the worst part of it so it could have amazing special effects it could have amazing music or whatever but if the acting is really bad then it's like it wasn't that good of a movie the acting sucked even though everything else could be phenomenal um in order for something to really for people to look at and be like wow that's really good typically you need to have everything working pretty well and if you have pieces in your portfolio that just are not your best work but you put them in there just because your portfolio is going to get judged based off of that worst work not the best work it's unfortunate it sucks but that's just kind of the reality of it and um so that would be one thing that would be the second thing i think is um you need to cut it down a lot you probably should have like i don't know i guess it depends on what you're turning it in for but i would say max like your best especially if you're like delivering it to them in person or whatever, like it's like you're like a physical for portfolio or like uh, you're sending it on a flash drive or something like that. Your best 15 pieces more than that. It's like, uh, they can get an idea of what you can do in 15 pieces. Easy. Um, I've turned in portfolios with even less than that with like eight pieces um, and gotten work. So um, I would say that's a big, that's a big problem. You don't need to put all your best work in just. And the other thing too is like, Let's say you're like, well, I know how to do graphic design, but I don't really like doing graphic design, but I know how, and that might increase my chance of getting work. So I'm going to put my graphic design in there. Well, then you're probably just going to get hired. Or not probably, but you're increasing your chances of getting hi hired doing graphic design work when that's not even what you like doing. So post the work in there that you enjoyed making because that's what you're going to, if they hire you, they're going to be hiring you, hiring you based off of what you showed them in your portfolio. And if you show them a bunch of stuff in your portfolio that you had a miserable time creating, even though you might be good at it or might know how, well, that's the kind of work you're going to get. So keep that in mind. Awesome. Renzo is asking, what age did you start drawing and did you always have a talent for it or completely self-taught yourself? Um, I started drawing as like long ago as I can remember when I was a little kid, which I mean, I don't particularly think is anything special. I think almost all little kids draw of some sort and I wasn't anything fantastic. I just drew like everyone else. Um, but yeah, I've been drawing ever since I was a little kid. I typically don't really consider myself becoming more of a serious artist until high school is when I really started to put in more hours and time and focus not just on kind of like doodling and messing around, but getting good, um, drawing with the purpose of improving. Um, um, but I don't know, I wouldn't say I had any sort of specific talent other than that I just put in a lot of time. So yeah, that would be my answer. Take a lot of hard work, a lot of hours. I do remember, I mean, I might have enjoyed it more than other kids. Like I remember when I was a little kid, my friends would come over 
we'd I'd be like they'd be you know we'd be like what should we do and I'd be like let's draw like let's just sit down and draw and they'd be like why like sit down for like five minutes and be like they'd be like okay all right well that was fun that's my monster can we do something else now and I'd be like wait oh, we gotta add all this stuff and so I mean I might have enjoyed it more than other kids I don't think I was <laughs> any sort of like protege or anything like that uh i just put in more hours and more work than a lot of people who were my age at that time that caused me to get better faster one thing i've heard you say before in um one of your udemy videos is uh that a lot of people are like oh i wish i could draw like that and uh yeah, they think that people are just like naturally born with it you either have it or you don't what are your thoughts about that yeah, that's, I mean, I don't know, maybe there's some people like that, but I guarantee for anyone who is, would be considered a protege, if you look in how much time they've spent doing what they do compared to other people of their age, um, there would probably be in the hundreds, probably even thousands of hours worth of difference in the amount of time invested in whatever it is they're doing. So I don't know if that really makes them a protege if they've just spent more time than someone else. Um, but I uh, I do think there's biological differences with people's brains and that does play a factor in certain things. But um, I, I think that you can learn to be a good artist just like you can learn math or learn other things. It's not like you don't have to, I don't know, like sometimes people, when I was a kid all the time, people would come up to me and my brother that makes it sound not okay they didn't like come up to us but we'd be drawing something in a space where people could see us drawing or they'd see some of our work or whatever and they'd say things like wow i you're so lucky i wish i could draw like that like you're so lucky that you have that talent and stuff like i just could never draw like that and i know they don't mean it like this there's no they're not intending it to be like this but in reality that's like relatively insulting and discrediting to the hundreds if not thousands of hours i've put in to get good at drawing because they're basically just saying wow you're so lucky that you were just randomly rolled the dice and got the drawing side face up lucky you and it's like uh, no um i have spent hours and hours and hours and i stayed up till three o'clock in the morning for couple of years of my life just listening to music and practicing anatomy and doing all this stuff like it's not luck like luck has nothing to do with it are you kidding that like that would be like saying like going up to a bodybuilder who works out six hours a day and being like dude you're so lucky that you just like have muscular genetics and it's like okay there might be some part of genetics involved in their physique but they also spent six hours a day for five years working out that has nothing to do with luck that has to do with how they chose to spend their time um so yeah i'm not a big proponent of you know it's inherent talent or anything like that i think it's um i think it's mostly not exclusively but mostly the amount of time and work you're willing to put in Samantha Pixley is asking what advice um, what advice would you give a high schooler looking to go into an art career? And we're at 1030, by the way. Okay. Um, high school looking to go into art career. Well, the uh, as, as usual, I was to make this a general statement. The more specific you are with your questions and your goals, the better answers you'll get and better feedback. And that goes for if you're getting critiques on art, whatever. The more specific you can make your question, the better valuable feedback you'll get. So art as a career is like extremely broad. There's thousands of directions you go. So I'm not really sure what exactly are you wanting to go into illustration, concept art, graphic design, you want to be a singer. Like, what do you mean by art, uh, fine art, you know, kind of see if you can narrow it down. And if you don't know what it is that you want to do, then I would make that probably move that up on your list of priorities is kind of figure out what areas interest you and what areas don't. And that can be a pretty big task. So what I think is a good practice 
is to start with the areas that are definite no's instead of the areas that are definite yeses. So like if you think, okay, um, I'm really into art, but I know I definitely don't want to do fine art. That's not for me. You can cross it off your list. And if you can cross off all the things that you know you definitely don't want to do, that will at least narrow it down to the things that you might want to do that either you don't know or that you have an idea of. Um, so either way, though, no matter what you want to go into, what I would do while you're in high school is that there's some pros and cons to being in high school. One con is that unfortunately the way things are set up, your time is almost completely controlled by other people and what you think is valuable for your time oftentimes is not what other people around you think is valuable for you to spend your time on, which is stupid. Um, but one of the pros is that you likely have access to a lot more resources than you're going to right after you graduate because they'll probably be poor and suddenly have a lot of responsibilities. And right now you don't have a ton of responsibilities and you have access to a lot of free art supplies through your school more than likely. And I would take advantage of that. Now is a great time to experiment with different mediums, find out what you like, just try as many different things as possible, different types of paints, mixed mediums together, see what you find works and that you think creates, creates good results because uh, once you graduate, it's gonna get a lot more expensive to experiment like that. And you're gonna have a lot less time possibly. So I would be creating as much art as you can before you have to start buying your own art supplies, especially if you're gonna be working traditionally. And um, that would be that would be my advice. If oh boy, maybe I shouldn't say this. I might get some parents mad at me. I don't give a shit. Um, if I could go back in time and talk to my high school self and give myself advice, I would tell I would I'm not even joking. This is what I would say to myself. I would say um you should spend a whole lot less time worrying about your grades and things like your uh calculus class and all this other stuff and all the things your counselors are telling you because it's a load of baloney and you should spend time working on your craft and your art and getting better um and i, I would also tell myself that hey you should start now you should start monetizing your art now start a youtube channel now start doing this stuff now. There's no reason why you can't start doing this stuff now. It would have given me a huge head start than, um, than what I did, which was feeling like, oh, I can't do anything till I go through all these hoops and I just gotta wait it out. Unfortunately, it's just total baloney. Not true at all. Would have told myself not to go to college and spend all that money, but Luckily, I didn't end up staying all, I didn't end up finishing and getting a degree. I opted out way before then, but I still ended up having to pay several thousands of dollars. But yep, that's what I would say if you're in high school. Hopefully your mom and dad let you watch my YouTube channel still. <laughs> Renzo is saying, not sure if it's a problem with you, but I'm left-handed and I hold my pencil kind of weird. And after long sessions, my wrist really hurts. Do you know anyone who's had a problem with this? I'm also left-handed and I also hold my pencil really weird. At least compared, that's what people tell me. They look at the way I'm holding my pencil and they're like, how do you write like that? That looks weird. <laughs> but I, I'm like, I don't know. That's how I always, this is just how I do it. I don't know. Um, but my wrist doesn't typically hurt. If that's a problem, then... Uh, yeah, you, I would look up some exercises too and start really trying to make an effort to hold it differently because uh, if you don't take care of that now, you can cause some serious problems down the road like carpal tunnel and stuff like that. And then it would just completely make you have to stop drawing, um, which would suck. Bobby Chiu, who I've talked about before, who's one of my uh, inspirations as an artist, he ran into that problem and ended up having to take a break from drawing for like, almost a year he couldn't really paint which luckily he had a lot of stuff that he had set up to provide income like um schoolism.com and things like that but i mean he is basically he can only do really light doodles like 10 minutes a day of drawing um without having serious issues with his wrist which uh it was the sad thing is that's preventable like if he would have known he could have 
not done that. So yeah, I would take steps now to make sure that doesn't become worse. Otherwise you're going to run into some serious problems, go see like a nerve specialist or something like that. Samantha Pixley is saying, do you, did you always know you wanted to be an artist or did you have to choose between other interests? The latter is the position that I'm in. Um, well, I mean, you always have to choose. It's not like there is some cosmic decision that was made for me beforehand that I just had to figure out what it was. I don't believe that at all. Um, I think I just chose, Hey, I think art's pretty fun. I really enjoy it. That's what I'm going to do. Um, here's the thing. Here's my take on it. Honestly, I wouldn't even really consider art my passion. I really, really like it. I really enjoy it. I think it's really fun. And I like creating stuff. I think I would say my real passion would be more of storytelling or communicating ideas. I did comedy improv for like 10 years. You guys are probably like, what? But you're not very funny. Um, <laughs> I, uh, but yeah, I did comedy improv for 10 years and I was pretty good at it. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, and I would actually consider that more of my passion just because of the amount of level of fulfillment I get from it. But I don't think that I need to do that for a living to still enjoy it or to be fulfilled in the work I do now. I, and I think more than one thing can be your passion. I think that can change over time as well as you develop as a person. Um, I think what's more important than doing something that you're passionate about is doing something that uh, at the very least you can find a level of fulfillment in. And for me, and I think this is a little bit more true for a lot of people as well, is that um, you can find fulfillment in a lot of stuff as long as two things are being met. One, it doesn't compromise your personal values. So for example, I worked at Discover Card for a while as a, basically as a collections agent, as a debt collector. And I could not find fulfillment doing that because I felt like I was frequently being asked to lie or perhaps not flat out lie, but be somewhat dishonest. Um, in my approach to things. And I just wasn't really okay with that, which is why I quit eventually, uh, among other reasons. And then the other thing that I think, so if it doesn't cause you to have to compromise your values, I think that's one of the requirements to find fulfillment in it. And then the other requirement I think um, is that you are consistently working towards something, producing something. And that can be, I think that can be done at a job, like a nine to five job, or I think it can be done on your own, but um, yeah, doing something where you are working, you know, actually getting something done and it's not compromising your values. Um, Cause like sometimes you might have a job, but you actually aren't doing anything. Like for example, customer service, there might be some people who can find that fulfilling, but for a lot of people, they're not really doing anything. They're not working towards something um, that they can show at the end of the day. Like, here's what I accomplished, you know, here's the, here's the finished result of my work, you know? Um, so I'm trying to remember what the original question was, did you have to choose between your other interests? So mm -hmm. yeah, I did have to choose. But I don't think it's as big a deal as people make it out to be because there's no reason why you can't change at any point in your life and be like, all right, well, I found that really interesting. I want to try doing this now. I want to move on to something else um, and see what that's like. So, um, yeah, college or at least high school, I mean, well, I'm in college too, but high school really, really likes to push this idea that you got to pick something now. And once you pick that thing, that's it. That's what you're doing for the rest of life. And that you need to go to school, to college, so you can learn how to do that thing. And then once you learn how to do that thing, then you do the thing and your learning phase is over. They kind of really break things up into like learning, the learning phase and the doing phase. And they're very separate and they're very distinct. And once you pick one, that's it. And that is just the biggest load of baloney ever. Uh, your learning phase and your doing phase should be heavily mixed in together. Um, 
you should always be learning and you should always be doing. You shouldn't just be learning by theoretically thinking about doing it. You should be learning by doing it. And you should be, once you are, you know, once you've made it, so to speak, or you're a professional artist, whatever, you still need to constantly be learning how to improve and stuff like that, learning new skills. In fact, I'm going to get merchandise up on my YouTube channel eventually, but I designed a shirt that says lifelong learner to the end that I really like that I wear a lot. And uh, yeah, I'd say that embodies my philosophy on learning is that I hope to be learning till the day I die. So that was a big old mouthful for a question that you asked, but yeah, I had to choose. <laughs> Everyone has to choose. Anyways, you're welcome. NetStrive is asking, hey, Austin, if I were to ask you one question, it would be what inspires you? Um, kind of a broad question. Yeah. Um, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. It, my, my initial answer, my thought, like as soon as you said that was, uh, what inspires me is the things that inspire me. Like, <laughs> I don't know, just things that I think is cool. Like, um, really great stories inspire me things that people put a lot of work and effort into where you can just like tell that they cared about it. Like, um, I guess I could tell you like my top five favorite movies. I would say those inspire me. I would say top five would be in no particular order, just kind of in the top five I'd say would be, um, star Wars empire strikes back. Quigley Down Under. In fact, my name, my dog Quigley is named after uh, Tom Selleck's character, Quigley, Matthew Quigley from that movie. Um, so Quigley Down Under, Empire Strikes Back, um, Jurassic Park, the original one. Was that three? The Black Balloon. It's kind of a smaller indie film made in Australia about... Uh, a boy whose older brother has autism and how he deals with that. And I just, I think it's a beautifully made film. That's just, it's really good. Great acting. Um, so the black balloon, and then that leaves one more and I would probably put, it's another really small movie. Most of you probably never heard of it, but it's called Rigoletto. Um, yeah, it's cool. I, it's really low budget. Um, I just really like it. I think it's a beautiful story, really well crafted, really well written. I just love that movie. Um, yeah, I just think it's well done. It's got, I'm not particularly religious. I'm not religious at all, actually, but, um, it has some religious undertones, but I still think that it has a, the underlying principles and the message is still really profound really like rigoletto um yeah i don't you know just other stuff i really like i really like breaking bad and walking dead As, hell on wheels is an awesome show love westerns avatar last airbender is one of my favorites brandon sanderson's work like uh game or way of kings and mistborn and stuff if you guys have read that i think is a big influence but i don't know things that you can tell people really put a lot of effort and passion into i think it really motivates me to be like i want to make something like that that's cool Which, by the way, that, that reminds me, if any of you are, I mean, if, of course, some of you have got to be 
Airbender fans, Avatar fans. Um, and if you didn't know, they have announced a live action rendition that's coming out on Netflix of Avatar. And it's uh-huh. being worked on and created by the original creators who made the animated series. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so I'm pretty stoked for that. I'm like apprehensive. Like, it's like, please, please don't, please don't be like M. Shalon Knight's movie. But um, I've, I'm hoping it's good. Try not to get my hopes up too high. Learn my lesson after Star Wars came out. So can't let myself get hurt like that again. <laughs> oh, man, I forgot to switch the legs up. Oh, well. We just uh, will have the legs not being opposed, and we'll just have them be straight. At least the the back ones will have that one leg in the front still up. But Netstripe is asking: Has any live action anime movie been good? I don't know. I might. <laughs> good question. I'm not really a big anime guy, honestly. I really like Avatar. It's like, I know anime people be like, that's not anime because it's really Americanized. Um, I don't know. I'm not huge into anime. I don't have anything against it. Just in any of the anime that I ever watched or happened to check out, it just seemed like uh, I could not get over the... So many of the main characters are just like super moody, that sort of like... (sighs) I'm so serious and like ugh, just drive me cr- like that really what's the word I'm looking for um angsty you know that real angsty vibe I was just like oh my gosh like you're so annoying like stop <laughs> stop acting so dumb but uh that's why I like avatars because Aang is like really idealistic and optimistic he still has a lot of weight and like struggles that he has to deal with but um I like how he's not like this always oh, super dark and super moody all the time and I like that about Aang. Any other questions we got? What kind of dog is Quigley? Quigley, my boy. Quigley is half Alaskan Malamute, half long fur German Shepherd. And he's actually uh He's bred from Brazilian German Shepherds because U.S. German Shepherds have so many problems with inbreeding that they end up having a lot of health problems, like a lot of hip dysplasia and stuff like that and shorter lifespans. And so he's bred with a Brazilian German Shepherd because they have a lot more diverse gene pool. And so his mom was a long-haired German Shepherd and his dad was a Alaskan Malamute. So he loves the snow. He's kind of got the best of both worlds. Worlds. It can go either way when you mix those breeds. They're called they're called Alaskan Shepherds. It's kind of like the um I don't know, not like slang, but like I don't know. Anyways, they're called Alaskan Shepherds, and um, German Shepherds tend to get along really well with other dogs and be super social and really active. But they also can sometimes be a little bit more aggressive towards people and you know not do as well with like kids or other people and stuff like that while malamutes tend to get along really well with people but not very well with other dogs and they can be kind of aggressive towards other dogs um and be also really lethargic and not like doing a lot of stuff quigley gets along super well with kids and other people and super well with other dogs he's never been aggressive once in his life so far and um he can go from being really high energy to just like chilling and relaxing and sitting his head on your lap and laying there. So we got kind of like the best of both worlds. He's a good boy. He can get a little bit excited sometimes though when people come over, but for the most part, he's he's a good dog. All right, we got about 10 minutes left.
I'm curious to know what other people are drawing. I know there are a couple ideas at the beginning. Uh, it would be fun to know what people decided to do. Octopus tribesman. Ooh, that's cool. Yeah, I, I think this one turned out pretty decent so far. Um, makes me want to look at more reference of of seahorses because I feel like I can make it look even more realistic. So I just like put little pokey bits all over. But I think if I had some reference to go off of, I could pull it out a little more realistically. But it didn't turn out bad, honestly, I'd say. Sophie is doing a fish walking with knapsack and hat. And then we've got another one doing a wolf creature with bad anatomy. <laughs> well, that's why we're practicing. So you can hopefully start to turn that bad anatomy into good anatomy. Just remember when you're drawing quadrupeds, especially mammals, you got your rib cage, your hips, your head, by the neck and your legs, the other shoulder blades, all your major joints. Just uh, check out the video I did on drawing animals. It will help you a lot. And then you can just mess around with the proportions and stuff and exaggerate or change things. So Victor von Bonbon's doing a jellyfish, uh, saying my I hope, desert. I hope that's your real name. <laughs> my desert jellyfish is kind of a hot air balloon. Oh, that's kind of cool idea. That sounds like something that could be an avatar. Honestly. Jay Lee's saying maybe I'll practice a quadruped but still thinking of which aquatic creature to base it on. Yeah. I mean, you could do something like a penguin that's like semi-aquatic or like a seal. That might be interesting. A manatee, that could be a fun one. Like a manatee, hippo, elephant creature. Saltwater crocodile. Those are both kind of more like amphibious than they are purely aquatic, but it's probably close enough. I should start trying to plan ahead and think what I'm going to do for the prompt the next day so that I can do reference that's like more applicable. So Denna M. Davis is just joining us. And if there's anybody else who's uh, just joining us now or um, came late, uh, the prompt is if an aquatic creature adapted to live on land. So that's why you'll see he's mixing a horse and a seahorse. And also I should note that um, as always, if you come in late, the prompt is always posted in the description of the video. And also at the beginning of the chat.
Yeah, I feel like I got my horse references down pretty well. It looks like a horse, but I could definitely use some more uh, seahorse studies. I mean, it like it resembles a seahorse, but it's not like that is a, it looks just like a seahorse, you know, like the the textures and stuff like that. So it looks like we got a couple new people, and uh, we got the question again: What exactly is the daily sketch grind? So the daily sketch grind is this live stream where we get together every single day from 10 to 11. Sometimes we go a little longer. Um, we get together every day and draw for one hour. And then we post the results in the Facebook group, the daily sketch grind. And the goal is to improve our drawing skills over time and just slowly work on getting better and better and better. Uh, specifically the drawing part of things. You can work digitally, you can work with paper pencil. Um, yeah, we do that every day. And every other day is a reference study of whatever you want, just drawing from a reference photo and trying to um, build up our visual libraries and our brains, our mental libraries. And then the um, the on alternating days, we do a prompt to kind of stretch our creative muscles and implement what we learn through our, through our reference. So that's the daily sketch grind. We're grinding to get better so all right well i feel like i finished early i don't think there's much more i can add without going into like shading and stuff like that and we definitely won't have time to do that um but yeah what do you guys think did it turn out good i think it turned out pretty cool i'm i'm happy with this one stop it let's turn that one there we go All right. Any other last questions before we end for today? How long does the daily sketch gr sketch grind go on? Well, like how long are we going to do this for? Um, well, we do it for an hour every day at least. Sometimes we've gone over, but for now, I'm going to do it for at least 30 days, but I'm probably going to keep going after that. Um. I'm not hard committing to this, but I was thinking that maybe I should try and do it for a whole year and see if I can draw every single day and live stream it for an entire year. Um, <laughs> Beta Lux says forever. Yeah, forever. <laughs> um, so yeah, for foreseeable future, for at least for now, I'm just going to keep doing it. Um, but yeah, that's, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I actually kind of had the idea that eventually I want to keep this going and kind of build a much bigger community around it that exists even more than outside of just myself and um, eventually get it so that um, I have other artists who participate who can host it as well. So it's not just me so that if I have to go out of town or something, you know, someone else can be hosting it so that we can make sure it actually goes every day and keep that sort of sustainable um i think that would be cool so uh we'll see who knows but for the foreseeable future i don't have any plans of stopping so tell i'm dead drop till i'm dead all right well, I'm going to say that's it for today. Um, as always, post your work on Instagram with hashtag SketchGrind for a chance to be featured on the SketchGrind Instagram page and post your work in the Facebook group so that we can uh, see each other improve and share what we're working on. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Same time. We'll be here drawn away, getting better, improving ourselves. 10 o'clock and you guys have a good one.